hope is born. Isn't that what we're celebrating? Isn't that, isn't that like supposed to be part of Christmas, right? Aside from Santa Claus and, and reindeer and stockings and Christmas trees and, and all the other things that we seem to place importance on. Isn't he the reason? Isn't this the reason? You know, Christ coming and becoming just like us. Hope is born. I hope that you realize this. I hope that you understand this. Hope is born. It says in Isaiah 9 and 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. It says, it says, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting, Father, and the Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and the peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From this time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Man, I'm telling you that hope is born this morning. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know if you feel like you're sinking. I don't know if you feel like you're all alone. I don't know, I don't know what it is that you're facing, what it is that you're up against. But what I do know is this, is this time of year... Man, we need to be reminded that hope is born. It was a Savior. He was a Son. He did not let us down. God has not led us in darkness. You are not lost. But I'm telling you, you've got something that the world is dying to hear about. His name is Jesus Christ. Hope is born. Peter wrote this in his, letter, his first letter. Chapter 1, verses, verse 3, really through 5, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. I'm telling you, what's the message this morning? Man, hope is not just born, but you have hope. There is hope. We've been given a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You have an inheritance that can never perish, it can never spoil, it can never fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We have hope this morning. I'll tell you, in a very hopeless world, in a very hopeless uh, circumstance or situation that may, be, that may be rubbing itself up against your life, hope is born. There is hope. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, look, he said, you're pressed on every side, but you're not crushed. You're perplexed, but you're not in despair. You're persecuted, but you've not been abandoned. You've been struck down, but you've not been destroyed. David said that weeping may endure for the night, but joy is coming in the morning. What do you say? I'm saying there's hope. There's hope this morning. Hope is born. Christ is real. He's alive and he's well. We've got hope today. Man, we need to live like it. Amen. We need to look like it. Amen. Some of you don't look like you've got hope. Amen. We need to, we need to express hope. We need to express this incredible gift that has given us hope is born. It's been God's plan from the very beginning of time. You know that, right? He told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29 11, he said, man, my plans and my thoughts, the things that I've got on my mind about you right now are to bless you and to complete you. Not to hurt you, not to harm you, but to give you what? Hope. To give you a future. Man, hope is born today. Amen? That's what, that's what this time of the year is all about. Some say, well, was Jesus really born on December the 25th? Probably not. Is there any way to know for sure what day he was born on? Probably not. But we ought to celebrate it anyways. Amen? We just take this time to recognize something incredible. God's greatest gift. What did we talk about last week? John 3, 16, because God loves you so much, he gave. He gave his son. What an incredible gift. Man, that is hope. Hope was birthed on this planet when Jesus came in that manger. Hope is born today. Amen? You've got hope today. I know that you've carried in a situation that dictates otherwise, but there's this living Savior that's got a message for you today. Hope is born. Hope is here. Amen? So pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come before you one more time. God, thanking you and praising you, giving you glory, giving you honor. Hallelujah. You are a good God. Man, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. You're the best thing that's ever happened to any one of us. God, you have been good to us. Every good thing comes from above. We recognize that, and God, we give you glory for it. Hallelujah. We thank you today. We are welcoming you. We're welcoming your word. God, speak to us. God, there are those this morning that have come that, I don't know, they've lost hope. As the Word says, they're hopeless. God, they need to be hopeful. 
God, I pray that you would fill your people full of hope, that we would realize at, at, at this time of year especially that hope was born. Hope is born. Hope is here. That we may feel like we're sinking in a situation. We may feel like we're lost with no direction. We may feel like we're all alone. But your word and your son say otherwise. We are not alone. and We are not lost. And we are not sinking. Absolutely not. Hope says otherwise. I pray that you would speak into the hearts and lives of your people. And for this I'll thank you. Praise you. Hallelujah. Giving you glory and honor. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. And the church said, Amen. 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 Hope is born. You ever thought about that? I came across this uh, video. I'm always looking for all kinds of things, right? I, and again, I apologize. I don't have any wine cakes to give away today. I'm sorry. I know last week I gave away all the cakes. That's all that I had. That's all that I had. I'm tapped out, Billy. I'm tapped out. But come next week. Come next week uh, because there will be a lot more than wine cake. Amen? There'll be a, the table will be spread before us. Come check it out next week. No wine cakes today. Uh, nothing like that. But I've got something that tastes better, right? What does it say? The taste of what? Taste of the Lord and see that he is good. Boy, I th you take a bite out of this, everything else just doesn't taste as good, does it? This thing feeds us, does it not? God wants to feed you today. God wants you to chew on his word today. And the thought is this, is that hope is born. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given. Man, we've got hope because of the gift that God gave 2,000 plus years ago. We have hope this morning. You know, the world doesn't have it. And we have it, and sometimes we act like we don't have anything. Boy, the church needs to wake up. You need a wake-up call this morning. We have hope. Hope has been born, man. He's been hanging out. He's been doing things, chilling. He's at the right hand of the Father, living and breathing on the inside of me and you. And he is screaming hope this morning. We need to grab on to some hope today. Amen? So what is hope saying? This is what hope is saying. I hope you watched everything that was on the screen because that's, that's the, the timeline I'm going to follow. What really spoke to me. And I believe it's going to speak to you. God has you here today. What is hope saying? Hope is saying that you're not sinking. You ever, you ever sunk before? Anybody ever sunk? I didn't always used to be a good swimmer. As a matter of fact, I'm, I, I, there's something about water that I don't like. I don't know. When I was, I was born in Hawaii, in case you didn't know that. I'm a Hawaiian. I'm kidding, I'm not really. Dad was stationed over there, and that's just where they had me. And I don't remember anything. First three years of my life, we're on a beach, and I don't remember any of it. How awful is that? Put me on your prayer list. But uh, we had, I don't know if it was my mom or my mom's friend, Francis. Uh, it, it must have, something must have happened. I, you know, must have been more towards the three. Because Francis went way too far out. I think it was Francis went way too far out. And, and the waves began to carry her out into the ocean. And it got really bad because she couldn't make it back. And they, like, had to call, like, the Coast Guard or, I don't know, they had to come in and do something there. And it was, it was a big, you know, big thing. You know, Tommy, her husband, was all scared that she's going to die. And I think it must have impacted me, really, because I... I'll only go so far in the ocean. You know, I'll only go, like, to about right here. I'm not going all the way. I, there is something about water, something about sinking that just does not jive with me. Have you ever been there before where you just felt like you were sinking, sinking? I remember, you know, I remember I was thinking last night, God and I were talking, and, and, and Kennedy uh, is 13. She's my eldest running the PowerPoint tonight, doing a fine job, uh, mind you, doing a fine job. She's training on PowerPoint and sound, and... I couldn't get her up here singing, so I said, you know what, then I'll get you back there. Uh, because that's, that's, that's kind of where I started, too. I always was in the, in the media room working on doing things. But right about the time that she was born, um, Heather and I were in a transition. You ever been there before? And we were in this transition, and, uh, uh, and a, a, a business deal had went wrong, and somebody had taken a lot of money from me, and uh, I wasn't very happy about that. Uh, I remember that we were searching where God wanted us to go in ministry. Um, I was between jobs, and, and uh, I don't know, it just seemed like we were up to our eyeballs in debt and had no money to pay it. I don't know if you've ever been in a place like that. I remember this was, the reason I remember this is because it was the first time I ever felt stress. I mean, real stress. I remember laying on my bed, and uh, we lived in Louisville, Kentucky at the time, and I remember, I remember it just felt like there was pressure coming in from every angle, and it just felt like I had a million pounds on me. 
And I think for the first time I felt that's, that must be what stress feels like. Uh, I could physically feel something that was internally taking place. And uh, maybe you, I felt like I was sinking. I felt like I was sinking. Have you ever felt like you were sinking? See, some of you this morning feel like you're sinking, and that's why God brought you here. I know it's just like, this is Christmas, Pastor. Man, you should be talking about really cool and uplifting stuff and, and the baby Jesus and, and gifts, and why don't you give some more stuff away? Man, God is giving something away, and it's hope. Amen? The message is hope this morning, and the reason that you're here is because you feel like the situation that you find your life in is causing you to sink. It's like quicksand. But God has brought you here this morning to tell you this. Christ, this hope that was born some 2,000 years ago, I want you to know this, is that you are not sinking. Amen? You say, Pastor, how can you know this? I don't know. It's that faith thing, I guess. It's that getting used to listening to his voice and trying to convey the things that he wants me to say. He wants you to know that you are not sinking. We saw it just a few moments ago, right? It had, it had Noah and the ark. You remember that Genesis account, you know? And, and, and it's such a wonderful story, and we think it's so cool how God did all these things. And I'm, I'm, I'm not arguing any of that. What an amazing feat to build this incredible ship. Uh, just the way that God brought the water, how he spared Noah and his family and all these animals. Man, what an incredible story. And then, then he opened the ark, and there was the rainbow, and everybody stepped out. And, and, and all of a sudden, it was, like, it was like everybody had a new beginning, and there was a promise. And, and everything just started coming together. But the one thing that we sometimes forget is this idea of being in a boat for 40 days and 40 nights. One thing that we forget is that for 150 days they were in this thing. The rain came down for 40 days. It was dark. It was stormy. But I tell you what, I mean, he, must have, he, must have, he must have felt like he was sinking. He, I don't know what these people were thinking. There weren't any windows. It had never rained before. What an incredible... We take so much for granted. We take the good parts of the story realizing that there was a part that was very tough. And for Moses, or Moses, for Noah, Moses is the next guy. Let's talk about Noah right now, right? Moses is coming. He's later on down the road. But for Noah and his family, I just, I thought, you know, as I watched, as I watched the video myself and as watching it this morning, is that, man, he must have really felt like he was sinking. He must have really felt like, where was God in all of this? You know, I did everything that God told me to do, and all of a sudden, God did something he had never done before, bringing all this rain down. That he had spared us all, and, 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 and everything was gone now, man. Everything was, it, it, all the people were gone. Uh, aside from his family and the animals, it says that every living creature was gone. It says that, it says that, that, that I think it was 20 feet, 20 feet of water from, from Mount Everest on up, if that was the highest place on earth at the time, 20 feet of water above that. Man, talk about losing everything. He really felt like he was sinking. I would say he really felt like he was sinking. But, you know, God always makes good on his word, doesn't he? God always comes clean on his word. God always, you know, it may look bad. It may look rough. It may be 40 days of rain, and it may be 150 in a boat, and it may be all of your family totally getting on your nerves. You want to kill every single animal on that ship, but God will make a way. He wants you to know this morning that you are not sinking God had a promise, and God was going to make good on a promise. He did it for Noah. He'll, did it for, he'll do it for me. He'll do it for you. I thought of, I thought of Mark chapter 4 of, of, of Jesus and his disciples in the boat. Remember that? Remember that? They're making their way to the other side. Jesus, we've heard the story a million times, right? And, then, and Jesus is asleep, and his disciples are out in the boat, and it says that a squall, the storm just comes up out of nowhere, and they felt like they were sinking. And they went and they rushed and they got Jesus. Jesus, you got to get up, man. You got to wake up. This thing just came out of nowhere, man. man. But Jesus said, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. And he just spoke one word, just, just peace. And when he spoke that word, he said that oh, everything subsided and, and the wind stopped blowing and, 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 the, and the boat just emptied out and the waters ceased to, to rub up against that. Man, I'm telling you, and I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're doing, but Christ is with you. He's given you a promise, and you are not sinking. Hope is born today. Hope is here, and His name is Christ, and He's still in the boat, and He's still with you, and He says that you are not sinking. Hope says that I am your refuge, and I am your strength, and ever-present help in your time of trouble. 
Hope says this in Isaiah 41. I love this. He said, do not fear for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. I'm telling you, God's going to hold you up. God is going to lift you out. You are not sinking. I thought about Peter and he's walking on the water and he begins to realize all the despair of this storm that's surrounding him and he starts sinking. And it says immediately in Matthew chapter 14, immediately that Christ reached out to pick him up. Christ is there. He is is with you you are not sinking I don't know what you're facing but I know the one who speaks peace I know the one who is with you and he wants you to know this morning that you are not going under that he will not forsake you he will not fail you like Peter slipping into water Christ is on top of your problems he lends a helping hand and he wants you to know this morning that you will not sink your problem is not going to swallow you up you're not going to get sucked in. Hope says, Christ says, that you will not sink. Amen? You're not sinking. I know it feels like it. It feels like the ground's a little shaky. It feels like the water is coming in over your head. You are not sinking. That's what Hope says this morning. Hope says, secondly, that you're not lost. It says you're not lost. That's the second thing that I saw. Second thing that I saw was this was this million plus people wandering around in a wilderness. Isn't that what they did? It's an incredible story, isn't it? See now here's the Moses part, right? The Moses part is this is that God did some incredible things in Egypt. He did, he brought his people out. And and, and he sent all these plagues and he sent all these signs and all these wonders and and and, and he parted the Red Sea. And, and what an incredible story, what incredible things that God did for this million plus, some say up to two million. I don't really know how many people there were. There were just a lot of folks. But God led them across on dry ground. But it says that when they got there, that they began, began to moan and they began to grumble and they got upset. It says that, is that Moses sent 12 of them into this promised land because like with Noah, God made a promise. He said, man, I've got somewhere for you guys to go. I've got a place that's going to be your own. I'm, I'm bringing you to a place that's flowing with milk and honey, Canaan, this promised land. He said, guys, go check it out. But, but 10 of the 12 came back and they said, they said it's no good. The, 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 we can't do it. We can't take this. Numbers 32. Moses is telling the people, he said, man, I sent, I sent all these people over, but Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that said we could do it. And because of your moaning and your groaning, because of your rebellion, because of your God can't do it attitude, the, the, the 20 years and older, all the men 20 years and older, then none of you except for Joshua and Caleb are going to move on. And so for 40 years, man, they wandered around. Kind of like, kind of like Noah and that boat for 40 days and for 40 nights, for 40 years they wandered and they meandered. Talk about a people who felt like they were lost you feel lost this morning you ever feel like you're just uh, going around in circles you ever feel that way I've told you guys the story before but it's the truth the most the most lost I have ever felt was when I was in second grade and we lived in El Paso Texas again this dad was stationed in El Paso Fort Bliss right in the middle of a desert boy I wish I wish I lived right in the middle of a desert today amen Instead, it's a winter wonderland out there. But uh, I remember we had just moved there and started a brand new school. And uh, I was out in the playground. It was like the first day of school. And I got up on top of one of the highest, you know, pieces of equipment. I can't remember what it was. And I could see our apartment building. And I just knew as a second grader, you know, as a second grader, we know everything, right? Uh, everything I needed to learn in life, I learned in second grade. And, and I looked, and I saw where the apartment was from this high point, and I knew how to get home, and, and school bell rang, and I took off, and, and I followed every single wrong trail. I walked into a cactus and cut my leg. I was wiping the sweat off my brow from the intense desert heat. I know, it was awful. I was probably more tears than it was sweat, but I told everybody it was sweat. And I thank God I found my way back to school. I never did find my way home. I was lost, man. It was like the most, I, I was so convinced I knew how to get home. I was so convinced I knew how to get there. And you know, in all actuality, much like the Israelites, the Hebrew children wandering in the desert, it was probably less than a mile, probably less than a mile from the school to our apartment. You know, for, for the Israelites, it was just, they, they say, 11 days journey. You know, some would argue how long it should have taken this journey to take place. It should not have taken 40 years. That's the point. 
for me, for me, I really thought I had it figured out. But boy, I was, man, I, I just don't know that I've ever felt any more lost than that moment right there. Have you ever felt lost? You ever felt like you're just in the same place? And you're running as fast as you can, but all, you're just running in place. You just, you, you know where God wants you. You know what God's brought you out of. And you know what God's trying to bring you into. But for some reason, all you do is just you keep walking in circles and you just keep, you, you feel lost. Some of you this morning, it's not that you feel like you're sinking. You, you feel more like you're lost. You just feel like you've got no direction. Again, you know what God's brought you out of and you don't want to go back there. You see, it's like you could just see where God's trying to bring you, but you're not quite there yet. All you seem, you just keep circling and meandering and, and you know what? You're much like the Hebrew children. You get, you get upset, you grumble and you complain and we become rebellious. But the point is this, the point is this is that hope is born today. Hope, that's what we're celebrating. Hope is here today. And just like with the Hebrew children, just like, just like uh, Moses telling them in, 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 in Numbers 32 of this, this story that took place, God's going to raise up a Joshua generation. That eventually everyone who's 20 years and up is going to, it's all going to, one day that's going to pass. God's going to make good on a promise like he did for Noah. He'll do for you as he did for Moses. He'll do for you. He made a promise and he raised up a new leader and he, and he, and he, and he gave him a new vision and he showed him what to do and he took him places that he'd never been before and they prepared the people and they crossed over again and they did. They got that land and they moved in and they conquered and they began to build and they began to do everything that God said that they would do you need to know this morning that hope is here and you may be lost but God is going to open a door you may feel like you don't know where you're going you're running in place and where in the world is God in the middle of all this I am telling you God is going to make a way Boy, this is what he told me he said this he said the steps of a good are ordered by the Lord Psalm 37 and 23 you've got to know as a child of God that he's ordering your steps you say, well, how about the people in the desert, man? What were they doing? They were just working out the kinks, man. God was just making them ready for the next step. I'm not saying that, you, look, that you're going to miss it and that you're going to die before there's a Joshua generation that's ever raised up. I'm telling you, we're in the New Testament. We're under a new covenant. There's this Savior, a Son, the Son of the living God that says this this morning, is that you may have to meander. You may have to wonder. There may be some experiences that you lack. There may be some things that I'm trying to teach you. But you are not lost because your steps are ordered of the Lord. God delights in every step that you're taking. He's teaching you things. He's showing you things. He's making you ready. What did he tell the Israelites when they got in the promised land? He said, look, I'm not going to give it to you all at once because you can't handle it all at once. I'll give it to you little by little. There are things that you need to learn. There are things that you need to be educated on. You need to grow in wisdom. Your eyes need to be open. Your ears need to be receptive. I'm going to bring you to a place, but I'll bring you to a place in my time. Your steps are ordered of God. It says many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. You've got plans, and you've got ideas, and you think that in five years you need to be here, and in three months you need to be here, and in ten years this needs to happen. Let me tell you something. We make all kinds of plans. But it's God's purpose that prevails. Always prevails. What did the psalmist say? He said in Psalm 33 and 11, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart throughout all generations. Let me tell you something. God's got a plan. It's a plan of hope. And you may feel like you're lost. And you may feel like things aren't clicking. And you may feel like you can't quite get where you need to be. And you're definitely not going to fall back into what used to be. God is working the good for though, man, he's got a plan. He's working things out, working for good in your life. Why? Because you love him. And because you've been called according to his purpose. Your steps are ordered. God's plan prevails. It stands firm forever. I was reading this earlier this week. I just wanted to share it with you because God really spoke to me. Uh, in the one-year Bible reading in, in Revelation, these letters, these seven letters. You ever read those letters? One of the letters was to the church of Philadelphia. And it really grabbed my attention. I really felt like God spoke to me. And I believe, I believe if you'll listen, he'll speak to you too. He said, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. And I'm telling you, there's a door. It's open right, just right in front of you. you. Say, Pastor, come on, man. I don't, I don't see anything. Yeah, you do. Where you are at is your open door. 
I said, well, no, I'm looking for something else. Well, then quit looking for something else. The reason you feel lost is because you can't come to grips is this is exactly where you're supposed to be. We're always hungering for something else. Man, get hungry for where you're at. God has opened a door, and it's right in front of you. And, and there is nothing on this planet that could shut it. And there was nothing on this planet that could have opened it. The problem is this, and this is where God lived in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9. Because Paul is, he's, uh, he's, 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 he's wanting to stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost. Because a great door for effective work is open to me, and there will be many who oppose me. And I thought about it, is that when we see opposition, and, and when we see difficulty and problems, and, and, and when we feel like it's not working out the way that we want it to work out, that we get all upset, and then all of a sudden we come to the conclusion that we're lost. But hope says that you are not lost. Hope says that I'm with you. You're not sinking. I've got direction. I've ordered your steps. You're learning. You're growing. It's okay. You're exactly where you need to be. You are not lost. You, how can you be lost if you're in the palm of God's hand? How can you be lost if, if Christ is living and breathing on the inside of you? It, it's contrary to what this word says, man. You're exactly where you need to be. And you're going through what you need to go through. And Paul was not going to, he was not going to allow uh, opposition to get in the way. Man, don't give up because something is against you. Don't throw in the towel because it's not working out the way you wanted it to. It's hard. It's difficult. Pastor, you don't get it. You would be surprised at what I get. You're not lost. You're exactly where you need to be. Hope. Hope. This hope that was born some 2,000 years ago that now resides on the inside of you, says you are not lost. Man, you are not sinking, and you are definitely not lost. Amen? You're not lost. You're being led. That's what God wanted me to tell you. You're not lost. You're being led. You know what your problem is? You don't like to follow. Everybody wants to be the leader, don't they? I'm like, if I'm going to get in the car, give me the keys. I've got to be driving. I can't let somebody else drive. I got to be in the front seat because I get sick in the back seat. Everybody wants to be up front. Everybody wants to be in control. Nobody likes to be led. And I think one of the results of that mentality is we feel like we're lost. You're not lost. You're not lost. Jesus says you're just being led. Amen? Still with me? That's good preaching. I don't care what you say. Amen? I'm being led. Last but not least, this is what hope says, and this is it right here. I promise. This is it. This is the last part of the second point of the third. I'm just kidding. Hope says that you're not alone. You are not alone. You're not alone. I thought about that. You know, for the last 13 years, you know, Heather and I have been, have been putting this family together. And... Uh, Obviously, we have six kids. You guys know that. So me even having the chance in the last 13 years to feel like I was alone is like, uh, you know, some of you have children or even grandchildren uh, or an extended family that is very close to you. you know, it, it's hard. It was hard for me to think about this. You know, I really did. I was talking to God yesterday. I said, man, when did I ever feel alone? But then it dawned on me. It dawned on me. There was a time in my life where I felt like I was completely alienated. And it, was, it came at one of the biggest transitions in my life. Um, like my dad, I went into the Army. And uh, I did this thing called a split option. I don't know if you, for those of you who are in the military, you know what that is. But a split option was after my junior year of high school was over, my junior summer, I went to basic training. So I was 17 years old. It was really cool because I was underage and they couldn't do anything to me. And I knew that. They couldn't touch me. You know. Back in the, they, they used to call it smoking you, and they would they would smoke you. They smoked me. Smoking means that they would put you on the ground and you would do push-ups until your arms like fell off. You know that's what drill sergeants would do for those of you who, are, those everybody else you don't understand. It's fine. But I came back and and I did my senior year of high school, but I graduated a half year early for some reason. I had enough credits and you tell me you give me a, a quick way out, I'm gone. So. For some reason, I had enough credits. I graduated halfway through my senior year in January. It was January 1991. For those of you who know your history, that's when Desert Storm happened. Uh, we had the, remember that, remember that thing? Okay, way back when. So I was already in the Army Reserve, and I'm getting ready to go back for training. 
in January, and my mom was like scared to death because dad, you know, it, we look back on it and it wasn't a big thing. It was like a one-day war kind of thing. But going into it, no one had any idea. No one had any idea. Dad was in Vietnam. Mom had lived through that. And it was just very tough for her. It was very emotional for her. It became emotional for me. Um, at this point, I was leaving home. I was never going to go back home. After this, I was gone. You know, never did live back at home after this. I moved on. It, I, had, I was all my friends, high school, everything. I think back about it. Um, Boy, what a time of transition. Everything that I knew, everything that I was accustomed to, uh, it was all gone. And I get to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and um, I, I, I didn't do basic training and then go straight into my AIT. I did, it split up. So everybody there was already a part of, a, of, of people that they knew, and I didn't know anybody. And I, I don't know, for the first time in my life, I felt more alone than I'd ever felt before. I didn't feel like I knew anyone, and I felt like everyone that I did know was gone. And even the stuff that I didn't know, I was never even going to go back to it. And I had no idea what the future held. And my relationship with God was distant at best. I know it's hard for you to think me not knowing God, but there was a time in my life where I really pushed him away. Uh, he, never, he never gave up on me, but I tell you what, there was a time. It was in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, that I felt more alone. I didn't know Heather. Boy, I, that was pre-Heather. That was, I didn't even know Hank back then. My goodness. See, if, if I'd known Hank, he would have came. He would have hung out with me. He would have joined the army just to be with me. Right, Hank? Yeah, right. Whatever. I was alone. Ever felt alone? Some of you this morning feel alone. You feel like you have been completely alienated, not just by God, but by everyone and everything. And you say, is it possible, this world that we live in, I mean, where people can talk to you via text, a phone call, they can, I mean, we can get in cars. We can fly anywhere we want to in a matter of days all around this world. We could contact people. Man, we could so keep, we are more able to keep in touch with one another now than what we've ever been in all of history. How in the world could this happen? It happens. And some of you this morning feel alone. You feel like there's no one there. You feel like there's no one listening. You feel like you're stuck between two worlds. You can't go back to the one you came out of, and you can't seem to step into the one you're supposed to go to. And all the while, no one is there. And what hurts the most is you feel like God is, is, is gone. He's, he's distant. But what Hope says this morning is that you're not alone. And what God has brought you here today to tell you is this, is that uh, because of his son, Jesus Christ, you will never be you are not alone. It talked about, I don't know if you remember the, the Hope is Born, that video. It talked about Mary giving birth to Christ. And, and, and the reason it did is because the people of God, the, the Hebrew children for 400 years felt alone. For 400 years. It says, that, it says that when Malachi got done writing what God told him to write, there was about 400 years of time. Where, where God wasn't speaking. Supposedly, God wasn't moving. God wasn't, the people felt alienated. The people felt like God wasn't doing anything. For 400 years, God had been very quiet. After the writing of Malachi, up to the birth of Christ, nothing had been said, nothing had been written. And it was prophesied, and I, I read this actually earlier this week. It says in Amos 8, 11, and 12, The days are coming, declares the Sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land. Not a famine of food or of thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea, wandering from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Everyone was searching. Everyone was looking. And everyone, I believe, I suggest, felt all alone. Boy, it's one thing if people distance themselves from you. Boy, it's quite another when it's God. Everybody was wondering where God was. Is God going to speak? Is God going to move? Is God going to do something? Where is God? Sometimes we feel alone. But it says, it says from the darkness of a mother's womb, all the questions and all the expectation that God formed a child. And from the darkness of that silent night, when it seemed the voice of God was unheard, when it seemed the hand of God was unseen, that silence was broken by the cries of a baby. He was a savior. He was a son. Light had finally pierced the darkness. 
It says in John chapter 1, verse number 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Man, something changed. Something broke the silence. It says in Luke chapter 2, you know the story, you know the account, that, that Mary and Joseph were making their way. They were traveling on a journey, found themselves in Bethlehem. And on that one particular night where that star was shining so bright, that God pierced the darkness, that God, that God took what was, what, was, what was empty and what was void, a bunch of people who were searching and hungering for God to make a move, to make good on what we call this Old Testament, everything God said he would do. On the hinge for 400 years, God finally showed. As a baby, child, Savior, man, hope is born. That is what God is trying to tell you this morning. Hope is born. It may seem dark. It may seem bleak. You may feel abandoned, but know this. You are not alone. Man, what's that song we sing, Emmanuel? It's God with us. It's not just a word. It's not just a song. But it's a reality. Christ is with us. He is with you. He is with me. He's still moving. He's still speaking. And He is still there. You're not alone. I thought of uh, the prophet Elijah. 1 Kings 19. Remember Elijah? Not Elisha. Elijah. Remember him? Uh, in chapter 18, he was like at the, at the, the prime of his life, right? He's on Mount Carmel. And and, and God's doing incredible things and miraculous things. And, and, and he's cleansing the nation. And Israel is like on the brink of a revival. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the king's wife says, uh, I'm coming after you. You, you, you can't do this. Uh, I'm not going to allow this. And what does he do? He goes from his greatest moment to his worst moment, just like that. And he ran with fear. And he left his servant behind. And he ran. It says he what, for 40 days he ran. He was on the run. He was on the move. He left anyone and everyone. He went through the wilderness. Man, he, he finally made his way to Mount Horeb. Trapped for 40 days, leaving everyone and anything behind. And what did he tell God? One of his biggest complaints was this, is I'm all alone. It was. He said, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one. God, where are you? What are you doing? I'm all alone here. I mean, he wasn't just physically alone. He felt spiritually alone. He felt alienated. He felt like, God, where are you in all of this? It's all falling apart. And I feel like I'm the only one. Of course, you know God had an answer for him, right? It, it was more of a rebuke, right? But we, we all understand, right, that God only rebukes and corrects the ones that he loves. Right? So when he rebukes you, it just means that he loves you. He said, Elijah, it's not quite the way that you think it is. And what you need to hear this morning is things aren't quite the way that you think they are. Nothing is what it really seems. Just because you think you have it figured out doesn't mean you have anything figured out. He said, he said I have set aside, man. He said, I've set aside, where is it? I'm trying to remember how many, 7,000 in Israel. How in the world did he miss that one? 7,000 in Israel have set aside that have not given up on me. You are not alone. He said, as a matter of fact, th there's someone I'm going to raise up as the king of Aram, Haziel. He's still around. I need you to go to him and anoint him as king. Jehu, I want you to go to him and anoint him as king of Israel. You think you're alone, man. God's got a plan. God's got everything worked out. He's got people and places that you don't know anything about. If you would stop feeling sorry for yourself and feeling like God has alienated you, you may get a word from him. He may speak to you in a still, small, quiet and voice. Man, he may, he may show you that you are not alone if you would just listen. He says, as a matter of fact, just so you know that I'm with you, I'm going to send you to someone. His name is Elijah. He's going to hang out with you. He's going, to, he's going to study under you. He is going to be the one that you pass your mantle on to. You are not alone. Noah wasn't alone. The children of Israel wandering around in the desert, they weren't alone. Elijah wasn't alone. You are not alone. You're not alone. Hope is here. Hope is born today. Man, you need to realize something. Christ is still around. 
here's his promise, Matthew 20, 20. He said, surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. I'm with you. Man, you have got a promise from this child who was born some 2,000 years ago, the Savior, the Son of the living God. And he says, I'm with you always. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. That's what he told Joshua when he's getting ready to step over in the promised land. Chapter 1 and verse number 5, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Solomon, the wisest guy in the world, put it like this. He said, there was a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I suggest that that is Christ. That is hope. That's who you've got. You may feel like you're all alone, but I'm telling you, you're not. Hope is born. Hope is here. You are not sinking. You are not lost. And you are not alone. Why? Because hope is born. Hope is here, and his name is Christ. Amen? Do you believe that this morning? Boy, that's it. That's Christmas right there. Amen? This hope, that w- that's a gift, man. God's given you hope this morning. And as Dr. Dan so eloquently put, it's been uh, a while back about that check. Remember that check illustration, Dan? It's like, it's like God's giving you a check, you know, for a million dollars. But, but it's no good until you sign it. And it's no good until you deposit it. You've got to receive it. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing to know that it's there. But it's, but it's entirely different to receive it, to deposit it, to make it your own. Hope is here. And Christ is saying you can have as much of it as you want. You're not sinking. I'm telling you, some of you feel like you're sinking. You feel like you're so sinking. You feel like everything is putting you under. You are not going under. You feel like you're so lost. I'm telling you, you're not lost. You're you're exactly where you need to be. You're going through exactly what you're supposed to go through. And God's going to bring you out. God's going to bring you through. You are not alone. And God is with you. Christ is with you. He will never leave you. Never will he forsake.